So 2008, fall of 2008, for those of you who don't remember, was just a lousy time. Um, you know, none of us thought we'd lose the kind of money that we did, including us. We were not, you know, we were not sheltered in any way. Um, and I have to tell you, that was an interesting time because in January of 2009, Joel came to me and said, you know, Heidi, you had a good run. You did a good job. It's not something to be embarrassed at. You should just close down. Let's, you know, find a way to unwind this politely and confidently. And I'm like, no, no way, no way. He said, no, really, you should, you know, don't have the knee-jerk reaction. You need to go think about it. And so I did. I actually, I, I took some time off from work and I spent a week as much as I could kind of silently thinking, you know, what is it that I want to do and, and can I do it? Can I do it with this model and can I do it with this brand and can I do it with these stores? Um, and you betcha. So I came back not only saying yes, but I came back with an 18 point plan. We're going to do it and this is how we're going to do it. We're going to do it now. And we have to, you know, rip the band-aids and some of them are not fun and some of them are not easy. And I was not popular for a period of time, but I did what I thought needed to be done to, 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 to support my business. And um, so we had, to, you know, we had to let some lovely people go, and we had to decide what was necessary versus what was, um, you know, luxury, which you know I want everything. And so you know, trying to make some of those decisions were, were, were they were hard for me. Um, you know, very honestly, I stopped paying myself so I could pay others. I mean, it was, um, it was an interesting time. Um, and then all of a sudden, like the light at the end of the tunnel, because after 12 months of doing that on the lean cuisine diet, 2010 happened, and we were more profitable than I'd ever been. Because I realized that we could do more with less. And so, um, so by April of 2010, I told my husband, told you so. But, <laughs> but then I called my broker and I'm like, okay, it's time to double down, it's time. We need to, you know, because the markets had, in my opinion, already hit bottom. They had certainly not come whole. I don't. I still don't think that we've matured and come, you know, full circle. But I called my broker and I said, "It's time. You know, it's time for me to get back to my business plan, which, by the way, was never two stores. It's time for me to open store number three. And so he went on his merry little way, and he came back not with just one location, but two. And and I have to tell you, it was really hard for me to decide. So I took the ideas to my banker. I'm like, help me decide between these two really good opportunities. And my banker said, you know what? These are probably pretty good." Yeah, I don't think you're going to get much better than this. You probably should consider both. And so with some, um, some financial help, because we refinanced my company and we paid off some debt and we recapitalized, and, but um, we opened two stores in last year in October. And, and I mean, I can't complain. I mean, we are still, I can't believe it. We're still doing very well. One of the things I want to go back to, which, which was talking about the bad economy, and somebody once said to me that a bad economy is a great business consultant. And I think if you stay in there and you persevere, that what happens is you, because I think when, we're, when times are good, we turn a blind eye to the, to the wasteful spending, to the employee who's maybe not as efficient or as <clears throat> effective as what you need. And I think if you can stand back, and even as we begin through this recovery process, it's still the opportunity to make the tough choices. And we really need to do that. And I thought it was something really interesting you said too, is that you went away and were quiet for a while. I think it's one of the most important Which things Which is a big do. deal for me, because I have a yeah, lot of energy. Too. Right? It was really hard for me to stay quiet, but I needed it. I needed private time. I do that, too. How many people ever take quiet time when they're trying to get through that? A lot of people, more than 50% in our room today, do the same thing. I think it's because you've got to hear yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, it was hard because, you know, my life and my brand and my ego was wrapped up in this thing, right? And so what I needed to do in that quiet time for me was I had to strip away what, you know, what the brand was and what my ego was. And I mean, I had to take all that off and say, okay, but just look at the business, look at the model, look at the numbers. What do you need to do to make it work and can it work? And so that was a, that was a big girl decision for me. Because in order for me to come out the other side, by the way, you know, we had to invest more money. I had to go in more into debt. So it was, you know, if you were playing poker, this was me doubling down and I did. That's really interesting. So now we have, so then simultaneously two more stores come online. Right. So how do you even begin to manage that? And you've got one in Georgetown and one in Leesburg. So now you're in Vienna, Virginia. You're in Ruston, Virginia, Georgetown, Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and Leesburg, Virginia. Right. All very different markets. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's commonality. How do you begin to even begin to strategize that to land in all those different places? You know, one of the other things that I knew pretty early on was that in order for me to achieve my goals of having kind of this, this movement and not... I never remember. I, I never really built the store or created this brand because I wanted a business. 
I mean, a, a, a job. I don't, I don't want a job. I want a business. And so I knew very early on that I needed to hire and empower really good people. And so I'm very lucky because without delegating and empowering and trusting the team that I have to run those independent businesses, I could not focus on the big picture and focus on tomorrow and focus on, you know, the, the big things like the brand and what makes us different and special and unique and the industry and the trends. So I'm allowed to focus on those things because I have great people that are taking care of the PLs. Each door is responsible is is managed by a lovely store manager, and certainly I manage them and I oversee that. Um, but I couldn't do that without them. One thing I heard you say is that you have the Heidi way. <laughs> you, have, you train your people in the Heidi way. What's the Heidi way? I don't know, but they could tell you very well. I'm sure. <laughs> I um, I don't know. I, I think I think for me it's. I don't want it to be a transaction, I want it to be a relationship, and so every person that comes to that door, I think you have an opportunity to make a friend as opposed to just making a sale. Um, and I think, I personally believe that for every time you do something wrong, somebody will say something 20 times, and every time you do something right, they'll say it twice. And so, you know, we do some things that maybe other business people wouldn't do just because I think it's the right thing for our brand and the right thing for the community. Um, because I want the reputation to be stellar. I mean, I live here. My kids live here, and you know, I—it's a reflection on me and who I am and and what I'm made of. And so, um, so the Heidi way—I don't know. I, you know, get it done, get it done right, make it personal when you can. And I think you—that's really reflected reflected in your stores. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing you have—we say the Heidi something all the time—but the Heidi challenge. You want to share the <laughs> Heidi challenge? Yes. Which I, it's always yes. in the back of my head. It's like. I'm so glad you brought that up. So another thing, I have this lovely group of peer-to-peer um, -peer CEOs. We meet once a month, and we share ideas and stories and challenges. And in 2009, after I came off Remember All This Private Time, I came to them and I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in. And so they questioned why I was doing that, and I told them, and they said, well, what else are you going to do on this 18-point plan? And one of the things that I came up with on my 18-point plan was something called the Heidi Challenge. I proffered to these eight, I'm one of eight, so these seven other business people, um, that if they wrote 52 thank you notes in a year, that their businesses would benefit, that they would personally benefit and they would professionally benefit. So they thought I was off my rocker, they thought I was crazy. Two of them said, you know what, I think there's something to this. We'll try it for a year, I mean, what do we have to lose? So three of us, for one year, the entire year of 2009, agreed to what, we, what affectionately became known as the Heidi Challenge. And we wrote 52 thank you notes. So we start, well, we started saying we were going to write 52 thank you notes. And so we started saying, okay, who do we want to write to first? Well, first we should probably write to our vendors because we were asking them for all kinds of stuff to help us get through this. So we wrote to our favorite vendor saying, thank you for staying in it with us. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. We want to work through this. We appreciate you being supportive. And you can bet that during 2009 when we called or put an order in and somebody else called and put an order in because I wrote a thank you note, we all of a sudden had a little leverage. We went right to the front of the line because nobody else was telling them thank you. Everybody else was probably screaming at them, right? So then we said, okay, well, who else can we write to? We wrote to our employees. Thank you so much. It means a lot to me that you're part of this team. I know you're making sacrifices for us for the benefit of this organization. Thank you for sticking around. It's you know, you are, you're valuable to me. Then we said, okay, who else can we write to? We wrote to prospects. And then we wrote to our top 100 customers. I mean, all of a sudden, this Heidi challenge that started off as 52 thank you notes ended up being probably 252 thank you notes. Um, and I can tell you that in the 2000, when we finished 2009, now I can't say it was just because of the Heidi challenge, but when we ended up three points up, 2009, I mean, it was, you know, it was a bad year and it was up over a lousy year. But nonetheless, I, I still believe that it had to do with us being just kind of grateful in general. And another little side note, in addition to writing the thank you notes and how it benefited the business, I think we also became just different in the way we interacted because we were constantly looking for things that we could thank and people that we could thank. And so it just made us change our mindset of being kind of grumpy and grouchy, but just kind of being grateful and thankful. And um, so needless to say, the Heidi Challenge has certainly stuck around. And there's, so I told this story, and I don't know, when will we be speaking? February or March or something of 2009, we were on a panel together. And I told somebody else about this, I told a group of people about the Heidi Challenge. And I started a movement of people that actually did the Heidi Challenge in 2009. And so if you would like, you can join me on the Heidi Challenge because I still write thank you notes. I think it's important. And I, I, I love that you didn't just say thank you notes. Thank you for, you know, the lovely luncheon or the whatever. No. You said thank you to your vendors. I mean, 
Just thank you to your employees. Right. I mean, thank you is one of the greatest expressions we all want to feel appreciated, and I think that that's really, really an important lesson. I mean, these are great lessons. I mean, we we've, we've had incredible lessons with you today. Oh, thank you. But they're, but they're things that are common sense, and maybe things we kind of forgot to do that I think are really important. Plus, you have a stationery store. I bet you'll give everybody here a good deal if they come in and buy stationery. I uh, absolutely will. Thank you I've notes. got some coupons to give all of you. <laughs> oh, so excellent. excellent. <laughs> so the other thing I want to talk about with you is your goal setting. Mm -hmm. I think that is an important part of your story as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think everything we've talked about today is a tribute. Anybody can incorporate these behaviors, these actions, these deeds in their business, and it's applicable whether you're a retail store running, you know, XO communications. No matter what you're doing, you can do it. So mm -hmm. share with us a little bit about what you learned through this process and your goal setting. It is at the core of who I am. Is um, I, I, I have 107 goals. They're written down. I have them color-coded, and they're broken down by three-year and five-year and three-month and weekly action items. I look at them every Friday. I've got an accountability group that I report into every Friday by midnight. We've been doing it for many, many years. Um, and they ask the hard questions, and they give the support. Um, and it, 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 it is who I am. So I wake up every morning and I look at a list that I wrote the night before of everything that I'm going to do that day. And there's no better feeling to me than crossing something off that list. And there's no better feeling to me than knowing where I'm going. Because I don't, we only have so much time here on this earth or whatever, and I'm not trying to be philosophical, but, you know, I, I want to make the most of it. I got a lot I want to do in a very little bit of time. And so um, I got to make the most of it every day. And so... Everything's on there. There's things for personal and professional, and there's things for my family, and there's things for my relationship with my husband. And um, if it's important to me, it's on that list. And so it reminds me that you know I need to spend more time with my husband because my goal is I want to have a healthy marriage. Well, so what are you going to do to make, to make sure that that's a, you know if that's really the end game? So what are you going to do to get there? Um, so 100 some goals. So how did you even? Define. I mean, how do you, you know, because after we shared this and we had this discussion, I went back and started writing after my fifth goal. Like, <laughs> how do you get to 100? I start. That's exactly how I started. I started with somebody, you know, I went to a workshop, and, you know, before you came to the workshop, your homework was you had to come up with, you know, written goals. Now, they didn't tell you you needed a certain number, but you had to have written goals before you could accept, you know, before you could come to this workshop. And so I started with a post it note, and every time I thought of something, I'd write it down. Then it ended up on the back of a napkin at lunch, and then a piece of paper, and I don't know, it just kind of, if you think, I promise you, if you just kind of free flow, write it down over the course of two weeks, I promise you all of a sudden you'll be surprised at what comes out. And there's things that are on my list that I'm not quite sure that I knew I wanted to do until I started this exercise. Like, all of a sudden I think that I want to ride a, run a marathon. Well, you know, I'm not doing it this year, I'm not doing it next year, but somehow in some way in my lifetime, you know, whether I'm 50 or not, I'm going to run a marathon. And so I'm saying it on a video, so that means i got to do it. <laughs> but, you know, I never knew that about myself until, until I wrote it down. So... So you have 107 goals. Are those locked? That's it? Those are the goals? Do you change them and kind of say, you know, that really is not important to me? I think a lot of us, especially women, we feel like, these are the rules. I have to do the rules. I mean, and I, I realize there really should be a lot more flexibility, but so do you change those rules? Do you add to your list? I mean, you've got 107. Do you add, delete? You know, how do I, you I don't, do it? Um, no, not really. I, I Every once in a while, there's something new that shows up, and I've um, I've actually crossed something off and then added to it. And I'm like, darn, I'm still at 107. <laughs> um, but they don't really change per se. Sometimes the action items that it takes to get there are changing. Like I never expected, you know, to lose a bunch of money in 2008. It's certainly not my plan. And so, you know, sometimes the path isn't straight and narrow. Sometimes it's a meandering, you know, path. But the goal is still the same for me. And I think it's just, my, you know, it's like exercise. Nobody likes doing it, right? You like doing it afterwards. You're like, wow, that made me feel good. Same exact kind of concept. It's like, you know, it's a habit you have to get yourself into. And then afterwards, you feel good about it. You are a workout. Speaking of exercise, you work out almost every day, don't you? I, <laughs> I don't work out every day. I exercise a lot. I, it is, um, I have a lot of energy, and it's how I, I blow off a lot of steam. And I do really great thinking when I'm exercising and when I'm in the shower. Because nobody else can, you can't interrupt me. It's my private time. And so... I run and I take showers if I want to think. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, the shower one's new for me, but that's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always think about it. I'm wasting water, so I always, but that's, that's kind of interesting right. that you do it there, yeah. yeah. I guess it's our, our thinking process. 